All right. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome back to Wilderness Wargaming. Uh, we just got a quick one here. Uh, I wanted to make this one as a little bit of follow-up to the first Military Monday. Uh, it was about tanks, and I talked a little bit about in there about the armor and the guns and what they do and don't do in certain situations. And for some people, if you're not uh, not too aware of this stuff, it might be a little confusing. So I'm just making a quick one to kind of explain these concepts because I will talk about these things in uh, future Military Movie Mondays or Military Game Mondays and compare what's realistic to what actually happens uh, using a lot of these these concepts. So, let's take a look real quick. Okay, so right here we have, obviously, Fury from the movie, and this is a good view of the tank. So, the tank, uh, as most World War II tanks, was covered in steel armor over most of the, the hull, um, including the turret. And tanks are always most heavily armored in their front, uh, less heavily armored in the sides, and le even more or less so on the top, bottom, and rear. It's just, it would, the tank would be just be much too heavy uh, if you fully armored everywhere. And you also have to have things like exhaust coming out. The air has to get in out for the crew. Uh, hatches have to be put in. Like if you fully armored the top of the tank, it would just be too heavy for the crew to open the, the hatch, stuff like that. And, and the front is the part that's supposed to be towards the enemy. So you put most of your protection there. Now, uh, if we take a look at the tank, uh, we're gonna notice a couple things, okay? First of all, Notice that the the front armor of the tank is not flat, or is rather it's not it's not that it's not flat. It's not vertical. It is angled at about 45 degrees. I, I didn't look up the exact angle for a Sherman, but it just eyeballing it, it looks like around 45 degrees. Uh, the sides, on the other hand, are not angled. If you're coming up from the side, they're straight up and down. Now this this is because you need to have a certain amount of space inside the tank for the crew to work. Uh, this this tank had a crew of five personnel. Um, and you have to fit them all in there. Interestingly, although it's smaller than M1, and M1 actually has only four because there's no assistant driver. Now, they've, uh, they've added some wood on the sides. This, as I talked about during the movie, this, this here basically is ablet of protection. It might disrupt around initially hitting the tank enough that it doesn't uh, easily penetrate this nice flat side armor. On the turret, you've got your thick armor in the front here, uh, around the main gun for the, the gunner and the um, loader and the... Uh, the tank commander to hide behind and then you got all your stuff that they need water fuel cans uh, bags whatever here on the back kind of out of the way uh, and then you've got all this track assembly down here and this can't really be armored too well either you could put maybe a thin metal skirt down here to cover this up but it wouldn't do much to really stop anything and let's take a look at why that is okay so um, in World War II, uh, there were different kinds of ammunition than what we use today. But um, some things have remained common. You're trying to, to penetrate armor, um, so you want to ideally get the, the greatest amount of force on the smallest amount of armor. Uh, and that way you're, you're, you're pushing into the inside of the tank where all the stuff you really want to kill is. And they, the guys who are designing the tank, they know that, so they design the armor in such a way as to try to prevent that. Now, one of the first things that, that they do is what I call the tension is the sloping the armor. And here is why, okay? If the armor is completely flat, like the side armor, um, and the round hits it, you see here, at a, exactly a 90 degree angle, perpendicular, uh, it's going to pierce exactly the width of the armor. Now, uh, rarely would it hit a perfect 90 degrees, but this is going to be pretty close to what happens with the side armor. The side armor is already thinner than the front, uh, but making it vertical reduces its effectiveness even more. Now over here, we can uh, we can see um, why this why sloping the armor is on the front increases its thickness by sloping it, angling it backward. You put more of the armor. In the uh, in the way of the route, if it hits exactly straight on, it will hit and have to go through all this thickness, which can be um, figured out by this angle x down here, the angle that, that it's angled at. The sine of that angle, and if you remember your trigonometry from high school, uh, sine is opposite uh, over hypotenuse, and that is going to be a number less than one. Now. A, the actual thickness of the armor, divided by sine x. And since sine x is less than 1, uh, that division product is actually going to give you a larger number. When you're dividing by uh, a number that is between 0 and 1, and the, the number that is being divided is larger than 1, you're always going to end up with a larger final product rather than a smaller one. Uh, 
uh, for the the more math phobic, I just trust me on that. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not trying to give a whole math class here, but you can see visually how it's going to result in a larger a larger amount of armor penetrated through. Now there's an additional effect that. Um, that I, I didn't cover, and that is the angling of this outer surface. Now, usually the armor was face hard. The, the, the face of the steel was harder than the inner core of it because they could do treatments to it uh, various kinds to make this harder. And you think about your, your typical bullet shape. It's got that, that rounded, it's called an ogive, that, that shape that's the front of a bullet or a shell where you have a point and then it rounds backwards. That rounded portion is the ogive. And if you um, are causing that 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 curved shape to come in contact with the slope, there's a much higher chance that it will just ricochet off and it won't, the armor's thickness won't even be tested. So that's going to offer you considerably greater protection than this, this completely flat armor right here. Uh, this, is, this is a very effective technique. Uh, I believe on modern tanks like the M1, the, the sloping is close to 70 degrees from the vertical. Uh, so in addition to the much thicker armor and the fact that M1 armor is some classified stuff called Cobham, and I, no, I don't know what's in it and wouldn't tell you if I did, but it's much more effective than just a simple steel armor. And in World War II, of course, everything was simple steel armor. Uh, I mean, steel was fairly advanced in terms of its uh, creation. The te technology for steel was pretty advanced by that time, but it was still just a single uh, homogeneous thickness of steel. And in fact, it was called that RHA, or Rolled Homogeneous Armor, was what the armor was. And when we um, talk about how much armor a vehicle carries, or uh, how much uh, armor a uh, warhead or something like that can penetrate these days, we still refer to it in RHA equivalent millimeters. Uh, because different types of armor and different types of warhead behave differently, the way that we standardize their, their penetrative capability or their resistance capability is to um, basically to estimate the what they would be if they were an equivalent level of protection or equivalent level of penetration if it were just uh, rolled homogeneous armor. And that allows us to more easily compare different weapons. Now, let's take a look at some of the, the types of weapons. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about regular or just a high explosive round or just a solid, you know, um, copper bullet, something like that. Those are not effect, very effective anti-armor rounds, and that's not really what they're for. Uh, we're going to talk about the ones that are actually designed to defeat armored vehicles. So first up, we have what's called the HEAT. That stands for High Explosive Anti-Tank, uh, or otherwise known as a shape charge. Now, there's different types of shape charges out there, uh, such as explosively formed penetrators, stuff like that. They have different specifics in how they work, but their concepts are all the same. And the HEAT round is the kind that you would see coming out of a tank main gun, or that would be on the warhead of, say, a Hellfire missile fired from an Apache helicopter, or a tow missile fired from a Bradley. And inside the, the warhead, from the outside, it looks like just the standard bullet shape with the OSHA Ivor and artillery shell, but inside it's very different. You have this explosive arranged in this long, this is actually a like a tube. Okay, this is all the way around. It's not two pieces. They've cut away the part that's toward the viewer, obviously. And then you have uh, this, this is like the primer back here and stuff like this, and then there's a liner. Okay, and this liner is made out of some very soft metal, such as copper, that's very malleable. Uh, it doesn't work too well with harder metals such as steel. You'll get a lot more fragmentation and a lot less penetrative effect. And this is actually a hollow cone, see a cavity. Stand up does now. What this does is when this here hit this hits the um, hits the target, this goes off and this goes back here and fires the explosives. And then the explosives, because of the shape of this cone form this copper liner into a jet of copper coming forward. Now, I'm going to oversimplify greatly how this works here. An engineer could give you a much more detailed description. But basically, that copper, even though it is still a solid, behaves like a liquid, and it has an effect almost like a cutting torch. And that jet of copper continuously flowing forward under the force of the explosive acts like a blowtorch to cut through armor. Now, how effective this is depends on a number of factors. Um, this, this has to, the reason for this standoff and this detonation is that this has to be formed at the correct distance from the armor. If you form it too late, uh, the, the jet will not have enough time to fully form and will be less effective in cutting through the armor. If it's formed too early, it will start to lose force and dissipate. So it needs to be fairly precise in how far away from the armor it detonates. That's the point of this. 
Uh, that's also the point, uh, if you've seen pictures of combat vehicles in the past, strikers with cages around them, the idea is to trigger this early so as to uh, disrupt the the warhead. Uh, it's because weapons like the RPGs that you see in movies, the shoulder-fired Russian rockets, those use this type of warhead. That's why they have that fr fat, fat, big front on them. That's why the Panzerfaust in the uh, movie Fury we looked at yesterday had that big fat front. Uh, that's to to allow this to happen. As the Panzerfaust did have this. This technology dates back to World War II. And uh, the amount of penetration you're going to get is a function of the diameter. Uh, back when it was first designed, you'd probably get somewhere between 150 and 250% of the diameter in terms of millimeters of that RHA standardized steel that you could cut through. Um, nowadays, the most modern ones, uh, some of them actually have this in several stages, and they're very, very sophisticated versions of this. Maybe get up as high as 700%. Something like a Hellfire missile would probably be six to 700% of its diameter. And its diameter is considerably larger than Panzerfaust. It's pretty... Uh, large diameter warhead. So the Hellfire is a very, very effective missile. Um, the, the, the big issue with these is that um, although we standardize armor in terms of RHA, that's just a measure, measure penetration. So composite armors like carbon that consist of multiple layers, the differences in the properties between the layers can be very disruptive to the jet and can get, greatly reduce the penetrating power. So that's why uh, heat warheads have, other than very large ones, that, that just overcome that um, protection through their sheer size, have not been as popular for actually killing tanks. Uh, they're very, very good at killing lighter vehicles. Uh, they also, because it is still an explosive, not all of the force goes straight forward. You'll still get um, explosion effects and fragmentation out to the side, so they're effective against softer targets, infantry, bunkers, things like that. They're still very, very useful but that is one problem they encounter. Uh, and that actually is something I forgot to mention with the standardization, is usually when you see armor, you'll see it rated against protection level uh, in terms of millimeters equivalent against both this, the heat, and this next type of round called the APFSDS, Armor Piercing Fin Stabilized Discarding Sabo. Now, some, a lot of times you'll hear these called Sabo rounds, uh, which is not incorrect, but the Sabo is actually the adapter. It's this big, thick, weird-looking thing on the outside. That is the Sabo. It's the front quarter for a shoe. And then the dart that's inside, that's the actual penetrator. The dart is technically called a long rod penetrator. And yes, I'm aware of all the jokes that that, that leads to. But this is what's inside. That You have the explosive back here, and that forces this out. And when it does, this breaks away, and all that's flying through the air is this dart. And this is, achieves a very high velocity, probably around Mach 5. Um, it gives very long range, very accurate, and it penetrates a lot. Cause this is some a very, very dense type of material, such as tungsten or depleted uranium. Um, the re Part of what makes this so effective is that the diameter of the shell and the amount of propellant you can get behind the dart is very large, because the diameter of the shell is much larger than the diameter of the dart. So a 40 millimeter dart, say, I believe that's what the M1's uh, rounds are, 40 millimeters on the dart, is in 120 millimeters worth of propellant. And that's what allows it to achieve this very high velocity. Um, both this round and actually the preceding heat round are fired, uh, generally speaking, from smoothbore guns. They are not actually rifled like a pistol or a rifle that a person carries or a machine gun. They, the gun inside is actually smooth. Um, this is because uh, in the dart case, you don't need it to spin to stabilize it in the air. It has fins. And in the heat case, you don't want it to spin anyhow because the centrifugal force would actually work against the formation of that jet into a solid, narrow penetrator. So uh, these these rounds are suitable for the, the um, smoothbore guns of most modern main battle tanks. Now here's what it looks like when it's actually fired. This is after, just after it's exited the barrel. Um, the barrel would be right here. This it doesn't take any significant amount of time because that that um, Sabo shoe, those those uh, pieces breaking away, generate nothing but drag. You don't need. This is not a rocket engine back here, by the way. I don't, I'm not quite sure what causes that glow effect. But the the dart does not have a rocket engine on the back. It's just flying. But this is what it looks like. These pieces break away, and this is what actually hits the target. And this thing is going incredibly fast. Um, and all of that force on it will be concentrated down to this little sharp point right here to try to punch through the armor. And then once it's inside the armor, at that point, it's no longer ballistically stable. It's going to bounce all over the inside of the tank and kill everything inside it. 
Now, uh, there's one other type of round that I want to call attention to just because it's it's interesting to me. And this is the British Army's favorite, and it's called the Hesh. Hesh target piercing T, I don't remember exactly, M331. I'm not sure that this is actually a British round. And 76 millimeter. This is a little smaller than a tank gun would be. This is a World War II size tank gun. Uh, the modern tank guns are uh, at least 105 millimeters. Uh, 120 or 125 is more common. So this is maybe something more like you would see fired by... I don't know, a, a, I'm not sure what gun, what 76 millimeter gun actually fires this. Maybe the 76 millimeter naval guns. I'm not even sure. But this is this is kind of what one looks like. And again, from the like the heat round from the outside, it looks pretty typically bullet shaped. Inside, though, it's a different story. The way the squash head works is a little bit different. When it's, it's triggered, uh, its explosive comes forward and it spreads out and makes like a platter on the outside of the armor. And then when it explodes. What it does is blows the inside of the armor off all over the inside of the vehicle. Now, this is uh, pretty effective at killing inside, the inside of the vehicle. It's using its own armor against it. Um, whether this is really, really effective against modern composite armors is open to question. Uh, there's assertions out there. You can find them on Wikipedia that's not. But the British still use this as their main tank uh, round for the Challenger 2. And the Challenger 2 has a rifled gun because of this. Uh, this is much more suitable to rifle gun, because in this case, you want the centrifugal force to spread it out. So that you get this wide platter of explosives on the outside of the armor. And then you get this spalling effect in the other. This is this effect, by the way, where the armor of the vehicle itself breaks off and goes all over the inside. That's called spalling. That's good if you're trying to kill it. It's bad if you're inside of it. Um, a lot of armored vehicles will have a Kevlar... Uh, liner uh, bolted on the inside of the armor, and that's the main purpose of that is to stop spalling, uh, to, to kind of catch the spalling and not let it kill the crew, uh, or, or damage the vehicle as badly. Now, whether that's enough to save the vehicle, that's open to question, but hey, if you're inside it, every little bit of protection counts. So anyhow, uh, those are some, some things we want to remember. Um, sloping, uh, the concept of rolled homogenous armor as a standard for millimeters of protection, and that's how we compare and measure things without just guessing. Uh, the three main types of real-world uh, penetrator we have: uh, shape charge penetrators, which for anti-tank work are pro primarily heat, high explosive anti-tank. We have sabo rounds, um, or armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabo, with with the dart. And then we have the Hesh rounds that are the British favorite high explosive squash head that is the, the British standard for armor piercing. Now, these in science fiction and st stuff like that, we'll get other stuff. You'll get particle beams, you'll get plasma, you'll get laser cannons, all kind of exotic stuff that we're not actually using to kill tanks in the real world. And we are going to look at the military aspects of some fictional stuff, and so we'll try to work on that. But when you're, But some of these principles still apply, the thickness of the armor, the sloping, and the need for an equivalent based measurement to, to rate things is still very important. So uh, just try to keep those facts in mind anytime you're looking at uh, military entertainment. This is how uh, armor protection actually works, uh, or at least a, is a very simplified version of it. Anyhow, thanks for watching. Please remember to like, subscribe, comment down below, and click the notifications bell for more great content from Wilder's Wargaming. And we'll see you back here again very soon. Bye.